Ace Hoffman is our uh, is our resident philosopher and guru on these matters. Ace. Okay. Well, philosophically, although everything we heard here was very important, I think one comment that Marvin Reznikov made should be taken home, which is that an operating reactor is far more dangerous than the spent fuel is, and this is important to us because there are five operating reactors within uh, close enough to harm us: three at Palo Verde and two at Diablo Canyon. The folks protesting Diablo Canyon, who have been doing so for 40 years, desperately need our help. We're the ones that closed the plant. I don't know how we did it, we did it. And they, they need our help. So let's all turn our attention, turn our eyes towards that, and get it closed. Rochelle Becker, who cannot be here today, she fell down while exi exiting a congressional hearing and is in a wheelchair now. Uh, she, she believes that we can get Diablo Canyon closed Quote, within 10 years, and I want to prove her wrong. I, I want to, <laughs> 10 months sounds good. Yeah, 10 days, let's get that plant closed. Uh, referring to the spent fuel, we heard from both of our guests how much of a problem that this really is. And there's a video I, I posted this morning, which was actually created from Kirk Sorensen, who is pro-thorium. Uh, and it points out that re when the fuel comes out of the reactor, it's got, say, 55 mi million curies per ton, per metric ton of uranium. Within a year, it's down to like 1% of that. And then another, by the time they take it out into the dry casks, it's a tenth of that, so a thousandth of the radiation that's there at the beginning. The point is that shutting the reactors is still the most important thing that anybody can do. And if you, if you guys wanna go out and do something, let's get those other reactors in California and Arizona closed. But spent here is a problem. But on that, on that point, when we were uh, fighting for the shutdown and against the restart, and we prevailed, the outcome was the one we were advocating, we got national attention for that. Mm -hmm. And from the National No Nukes team of the Sierra Club and many other entities, and then suddenly we realized what the nuclear waste management issue was. Now ACE and some others were already ahead of us, but some of us were not there yet. We were focused on blocking a quick restart of San Onofre when the technology was so bad, and we kept making that point. And amazingly, when Edison gave up the next day, they were saying the same thing about the technology that we had been saying, including calling it a lemon. So we feel pretty vindicated by that. But here's what we concluded. Uh, Tip O'Neill said all politics is local, and we treated San Onofre as a local issue. We helped shut it down because we became experts on San Onofre. We didn't deal with national ideology about anti-nuclear. But when we realized that every nuclear plant has the same almost unmanageable waste situation, it became the most powerful argument for a sweeping approach to shutting down the nuclear industry. Every plant that's still operating is adding to its volume of waste at a time when we don't have any real answers on the waste. So we believe that has become the crucial argument in the whole thing. And I'd like to call on Marvin for a comment. Well, I feel a little humble talking about organizing, you know, when I'm on a panel with Carol, because she's the supreme organizer in this, in this meeting. Um, but I want to get back to a point that Ray made, which is trying to clean up the plant as soon as one can, trying to dismember the plant as soon as one can. There, there are a lot of different groups out there who have different issues that you can speak to. And one is, or one are, the workers at the plant. The, the thing is, the workers at the plant right now are the ones that know the plant the best. If you're gonna wait for 20 years, you know, they're gonna be gone. And so now is the time to actually organize with the workers on the issue of uh, taking apart the plant as soon as one can, because they all need jobs and uh, they all have the skills and the knowledge and I think it would be good to start doing that as soon as possible. We have actually made common cause with the union and we have said these are the most knowledgeable people and we hope they play key roles in all the areas of their expertise in decommissioning the plant. Martha. I, I just wanted to say that on this, on your point Marvin, we actually raised this in our uh, testimony in this upcoming 
uh, week of evidentiary hearings, our written testimony. And Edison has already replied in their rebuttal testimony saying that it's not the same employees. They just want to sever all their employees and get rid of them. And, you know, they're just saying there's no point in keeping these folks around. So that, unfortunately, is Edison's position. But, but with that said, Martha, I think there is uh, what, it's a big question. And Marvin, his opinion, it sounds like, is that it's best to uh, dismantle the plan as soon as possible. Um, there's another opinion, I guess, which is, I guess, to let it sit for a long time and let things cool down. Um, I just wanted to provide that immediate yeah. information about the position that Edison is taking on its employees. So what do you think, Marvin, about that question? I mean, they, they originally said 60 years and let it cool for, for 50 or something. Well, first of all, the Edison is gonna, has to come forward with a plan, decommissioning plan, and that has to take place within two years. And they've their, said they'll do it their, in one. They've said they'll do it in one, 2014. And they're going to come forward with a plan, and that will give you the opportunity, one opportunity. There'll be many opportunities. That is one opportunity to actually uh, comment on, and you know, have an input into what's happening in, in the process. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to say about Carol will know better because she's the organizer, but but I don't know. But there must be a way. There must be a way. It sounds like uh, foolish economics to actually let all the workers go and then bring back a whole new crew. Right. Yeah, so the personal nature of it has to do with radiation contamination. Uh, I just um, moved back to San Clemente after living over in the Middle East for the past five years. And my shipment was also sent in June at the same time on a freighter. And uh, I got a, uh, it took two months for it to arrive in Long Beach, and I got a note from Customs that they have quarantined my shipment due to radiation contamination. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was uh, radiation that was in the, the sea container. And so uh, they will not divulge what the radiation contamination is. I finally, they won't divulge anything to me, to the shipping company. So I finally heard from the shipping company that they found the source of the, the radiation. Fortunately, it wasn't in my shipment, but um, they're going to release my shipment next week. My concern is, is there any health risk that's going to be involved to me in accepting a shipment that's going to that's had radiation contamination? Secondly, uh, what are any precautions I can take? And thirdly, how do you rid radiation contamination from personal, you know, uh, items? I would suggest you get in touch with Don Mosier as quickly as possible. I took a little action myself and it will probably won't get anywhere but i sent letters to the mayors and the councilmen of all of the six cities along the orange coast uh, that uh, have one thing in common they've just been praised by everybody including the county board of supervisors for having qualified as tsunami ready the point that i made in sending along my congratulations was to indicate, but what are we going to do just beyond our county line and moving highly radioactive and dangerous material out of range of the sea? I, they're on federal land, uh, paying a fee for it. There's considerable federal land in this military training area. And I think that if we're going to be tsunami ready, so that people know along our coast that if the flag goes up, they better go inland and how to do it. But what about what we have here to clean up? So anyway, I don't know where that'll get, probably absolutely nowhere, but the issue I think is significant. As I recall, you asked that question at the NRC hearing in Carlsbad on September 26th, and by the way, we took 
down your question verbatim and it's posted on the Sierra Club website. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I made it in life. <laughs> Uh, comments from panelists, questions from comments from the audience, yes sir. Yeah, I'm just a little surprised that you were all surprised that the workers are gone because you were all well informed that when the plant shut down, 1,100 of my union brothers were going to be out of work. So I'm surprised that you're wondering why we have such a skeleton crew there, you know, working at the plant. And yes, there's still a few of us there but not many. Thanks for that update because it's news to me. The LA Times did a pretty good job of tracking the interim cuts in workforce over the last six months, but they didn't catch the latest. So uh, thanks for letting us know about that. A question about terrorism, perhaps for our two uh, panelists here. Uh, in, in, 19, uh, in 2007, I think the National Research Council published a whole volume about the whole threat of terrorism, but they redacted certain parts of it. And uh, Sandia National Labs did some studies, some simulated, and then he flew some fighter planes and, and stuff like that. Uh, and we keep hearing uh, from Edison and the NRC, oh, we're safe, you know, we can crash an uh, airplane into the domes. Well, we're not talking about the domes anymore, we're talking about the casks, and we're talking about the fuel pools. And now we're talking about missiles and drones and truck bombs and, and rocket-propelled grenades and stuff, high explosives. And I think we all know that no nuclear power plant was ever designed to withstand any of that. But can you tell us a little bit more about <laughs> the kinds of possibilities of, of high explosives against in the fuel pools and the, uh, and, and the casks? These casks are so strong, would they hit? What would happen with a direct hit from, uh, from a drone or a, a missile? The dry casks are not designed to withstand those sorts of problems. They're designed to stop the gamma radiation from getting out to the workers who walk around and look at the thing every couple of weeks. So really, the, there is no protection against airplane strikes or uh, large tsunamis or large earthquakes or, or sabotage. Uh, yeah, hi, it's actually not a question, uh, uh, um, but maybe. Um, so often, they try to divide us into being anti-nuclear, pro-nuclear, and as, as if it's a debate. And I think we all have to recognize that we all have to be pro-safety, and we all have to be anti-nuclear accident. And there is just really no other path forward. Um, this whole experience for our community has put us all through a lot, including you know, many of the workers, and my family knows some. But I want just to say, um, you know, we, we need to have a consistent level and, and active participation of, of our community in the safety, safety from here on out. It's for everyone's benefit, especially the folks working at the plant. Thank you. Yes, uh, one of the questions that I have was, and it's been belaboring in my mind quite, quite a bit in here lately, uh, in the fact that since I've been about 18 years old, I thought, what are you gonna do with the waste? And, and, and this has been the really good experience listening, uh, you know, how we're gonna deal with the waste and maybe how we should do it. But uh, my biggest question is, if we could make a perfect container, a really perfect container, the best container, 10 times better than anything, uh, how good would it be at preserving the poisons that are left over from the plutonium and so on and so on? Would, do they know that it has a half shelf life if there was a better container? This is a question that Don Lishtling of our group, who unfortunately is not here today because he just had quadruple bypass surgery, uh, has been asking, and that is how do we segue possible breakthroughs in technology so that we don't lock ourselves in to today's technology forever? And how can we take advantage of new iterations that offer better possibilities? And I would like our two panelists to comment on that. Thank you. Well, you know, there's better containers and there's always a response, a better, more effective means of attack. You know, th this is a problem in war that has been seen and the present situation I don't think is any different because uh, the problem of how you destroy something is no, no more static than the problem of how you make it more robust. So, and all things degrade on the kind of timescales that we're talking about. 
Um, I don't believe it's sensible to assume that the government's going to be there to replace these containers or that the zirconium, basically the first line of defense is the zirconium fuel rods. And, and as we have seen, they're quite vulnerable. So while, and there's a price to delay, you know, the one reason I said, you know, look at better containers that maybe we already have, but don't stop the dry cask. And as I, I don't know all the burn-ups of all the, and how, how long they have cooled, and this is data I think that maybe the citizen organizing panel or something should ask for, is the burn-up of each spent fuel assembly so that we can actually attack the problem and know how much it has cooled and what the exact radioactive inventory is and what's been transferred to the cast and not. But the, the time scale of materials technological development is pretty long. And I think this, this problem of dry storage needs to be solved in a shorter time than that. And I do not believe that we should be relying on dry storage for the indefinite future. I think it's a, it is a, it's a terrible mistake to think that we can store it uh, uh, above surface or in, in near surface and, and get away with it. We, we won't. And we might get away with it in some places, but it's too dangerous. I just wanted to say a word about sabotage. Uh, <laughs> I've worked uh, for uh, the state of Nevada on sabotage of uh, transportation casts. And the kind of weapons that are available are definitely fearsome. You know, there, there are weapons that go through a meter of steel like it's through butter. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, you can't really prepare or, you know, f for almost, uh, you know, every eventuality. Uh, th that's all I really have to say about it. It's, it's a serious proposition. Uh, it gets us into a whole police state mentality, you know, about, uh, you know, eavesdropping on citizens to see who's, you know, g uh, gonna commit an malevolent act. Uh, I, I don't really know the answer to all of this, but I know that it, it gets us into a, a, you know, a, bad, a, a bad way of thinking. Ray? I just wanted to comment on the, uh, the actual numbers of the different types of fuel. Uh, we did ask that question in one of our data requests, and they, um, uh, really, uh, this is going to be a problem because they declined to answer it because they thought it was a, you know, a security issue uh, talking about the nuclear fuel and where it is. Um, and so that's one reason why having a, uh, it's going to be important for our oversight group to be somewhat of more official so that we can get the information um, and they're not going to be able to withhold it by saying that's too sensitive for, for you to know. Um, you know, it should be, uh, and we're going to continue to work on this, but um, it should be something that they can just disclose. This is how much fuel that we had of different types without going through another hoop of saying we're worried about the security of that. But we, we, we are getting, um, we, they did start to answer the question. We're just going to work on it more. But that, I just wanted to bring <laughs> bring up that issue. I want to hand the microphone to Gary Hedrick of San Clemente Green. Lori's here too. You guys have been great partners and you've really uh, turned out the local community for a long time on this issue and, and Gary you're very well spoken on these matters. Would you give us two or three minutes of wisdom and then and then I'm going to ask Donna to, to wrap up the comments. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to mention there's 1123 high burn up uh, fuel assemblies that require um, cooling in the Cool. We've got that information from, I think, uh, another intervener. I'll take the opportunity to just say thank you for the great team we have in this community and everyone that's within striking distance of this nuclear power plant has really stepped up in a huge way. Lori and I did as much as we could on the shutdown and we kind of got ourselves in a position where we had to rely on uh, other people to step up. and. Uh, Gene Stone and the crew here has done a fantastic job. We're kind of on the bench right now doing as much as we can, but um, we appreciate having the opportunity to 
catch our breath and get our lives in order and come back to this system stronger than ever. So thanks everyone for doing such a great job and it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you guys and keep it up. Thank you. Um, and Donna? Yes, okay. I, I don't think we could end this without talking about Fukushima. And it just chokes me up as to what's happening in Japan. And I think uh, we all need to keep informed and try and see what we can do to help and work closely with them. We're all in the same boat of this country. And we've got an industry that's really the terrorists that we need to worry about. And I feel so poor for the, for the uh, so bad for the people in Japan. And, and we really need to do everything we can to work with them and work together because, you know, we're, we're all going to be Fukushima's at the rate we're going. Uh, we're going to have to take action. The NRC budget was, they've taken money away from them to even do research and, um, you know, so it's going to be up to the citizens to turn this around. So we need to get people activated and, and we need to, to work with our friends in Japan and, and do, and do what, what we can and, and work together. That's the only way we're going to get through this. Ace. Uh, speaking of Fukushima, I want to make a comment about the dry casks there. They were, uh, they, they got submerged in water. They were not overstressed by the earthquake, and they were not overstressed by the water. A dry cask accident, there's 15 to 1,600 dry casks in America and almost uh, 80 or 90 different sites. There's going to be a terrible accident one of these days. And don't go thinking that just because the dry casks survived at Fukushima that they're the solution. There are no good solutions. I think we learned that today. Thank you. I wanted to follow up Donna's heartfelt comment by saying how much we appreciate the presence of the press from Japan at these events. In uh, San Diego on October 1st, the Asahi Shinbun, Japan's largest newspaper was represented. They've been represented today. We have another newspaper chain from Japan here. We have a documentary filmmaker from Japan. Uh, it's an ill wind that blows no good, and uh, we're forging some friendships here across the Pacific because of our common concern about these matters. Thank you again to everyone. See you next time. Keep in touch.